Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thanks for joining me right after lunch. I am going to talk about uh, accessibility testing uh, and questions that we can automate of accessibility testing with a uh, tool called Dumbot. So we're going to get into that. Um, so just some quick agenda. Uh, I'm going to cover a little bit about what accessibility means, just in case some folks might not be too clear. Uh, we'll get into some of the different types of testing and strategies. Um, we're going to actually go through some testing with, uh, or basically how we approach testing with one of our client websites. Uh, and um, yeah, then we'll, we'll have hopefully some time for some Q&A afterwards. So first off, uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Jesse. Uh, I am from a, a full service agency called Evolving Web. Uh, we're based out of uh, Montreal in Canada. Uh, I'm a solutions architect with Evolving Web, and that means I'm involved with the whole process of most of our websites, our new site builds. Uh, we have a couple of solutions architects on the team, so not just me, but uh, you know, we have a, a big team. Um, uh, I have various experience, about 10 plus years of, as a developer, uh, full stack development experience, um, and worked on various open source platforms, of course, including Drupal. Um, I've been interested and uh, working internally a lot with our team on accessibility for a while now. I've worked with a couple of uh, other, a couple other initiatives outside as well. I worked with uh, accessibility talks um, on a webinar a couple months ago with some of our team members and a partner agency. Um, I've done some training uh, internally with Evolving Web and externally with some of our clients, uh, and involved in some audits and just general, you know, helping on our team with accessibility-focused uh, development. A bit more about that team first. Um, so we, uh, I'm from Revolving Web, as I mentioned. We are a full service agency. Um, we really focus on helping to our clients bring their digital experiences to life. Um, setting their stories in motion, you'll see that we have a nice big booth outside that says that same thing. It's kind of our, our current uh, um, um, you know, way of, of thinking about things. Uh, expanding their digital platforms for growth. These are just a couple of the uh, different uh, companies and projects that we've worked on. Uh, we do work a lot in the uh, higher ed and government space, some finance, a lot of those sort of that style of institution. Um, so we're a team of about, at this point, about 85 people. Um, we've been working with Drupal for, I think it's about 18 years now, so a long time. Uh, our founders are pretty heavily involved in the community. You'll see them around. Uh, especially uh, uh, little ones, uh, 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 Sophia, uh, little, little baby of, of Suzanne and Alex. So, now let's get into accessibility. So, as I mentioned before we really get into it, I do want to sort of take a step back, uh, make sure that what I'm going to get through is going to end up being understandable for everybody, and then we sort of set the baseline of what, what I'm talking about, what accessibility is. Um, so, first, before that, uh, who sort of has an idea of what I mean when I say accessibility, and specifically as it relates to websites. Okay, so not, not quite everybody, so that's, that, that's good. We have, we have an opportunity to, to make sure some folks are, are aware of what this is talking about. Um, so who manages it of those people, perhaps? Who manages a website or is involved in content on the website that has certain accessible requirements? It's a lot of people. Awesome. Great. Uh, and who has done some forms of accessibility testing? On websites. Okay, okay, I'll let you. Finally, has anyone done a full accessibility audit of a, of a site? Okay, okay, great. Okay, good. That helps me to know sort of who I'm, who I'm speaking to. Oops, went ahead there. So, for those of you that don't know what accessibility is, it's really the idea of treating everybody the same on a website um, in the same way that we wouldn't create and build a new building today without certain accessible features like, say, um, accommodating wheelchair users. Um, we wouldn't do the same for, for a, a website. We wouldn't want to build a website where somebody who maybe is, is visually impaired can't understand the content. Um, or maybe you know, somebody might need to, uh, 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 subtitles to be able to actually understand the video content. So these are the kind of things that, that we're thinking about when crafting an accessible website. Y you'll see this um, sort of, I guess it's not only an acronym, but sort of a short form of the word accessibility. Uh, A11Y. Uh, you see it a lot if you dive into sort of accessible content. Um, it, it, 
oddly enough, it's kind of an inaccessible uh, phrase unless it is properly explained. So I wanted to take that time to, to explain that, make sure everyone's aware, because you will definitely see that as you if you're just starting this, this, this journey. There's a couple of main principles of accessibility. Um, content, websites, etc., need to be uh, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. Um, so that's the, the poor uh, acronym. Uh, Perceivable is kind of meaning, as I said earlier, you know, an image for somebody who maybe can't perceive the, the visual image, there should be an alternative for them to, to perceive the content. It's a common one that we hear with alt uh, attributes, alt tags. Operable, meaning a website should be uh, able to be operated in various other ways and not just through a, a, a mouse, for example, a keyboard or maybe a screen reader. Understandable. Uh, as I said, acronyms should be defined. Uh, so people who don't know those, it's all accessible for them. Uh, and, and robust, it needs to be something that's going to be you know, future-proof, that's going to um, be understandable by some of the latest and greatest technologies that are, that are helping uh, um, people who have accessible needs. Accessibility standards. Uh, there is a, a global organization, the W3C is the World Wide Web Consortium. Um, they are... A, global body that manages the different standards. Um, there's actually just, just been a new uh, recommended standard that just came out uh, October 5th. Um, it is the WCAG Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.2. Uh, so you'll still see lots of references to 2.0 and 2.1. Um, and 2.2 is a sort of superset uh, of that latest and greatest uh, uh, features. Um, the Below that, there's also then different levels within each version. So there's the level A, double A, and triple A. Uh, a being the minimum requirements. It's really, if you don't meet uh, level A accessible, your website is probably not going to be usable by somebody who has certain, certain needs. Double A is oftentimes the, the recommendation. If you look at some of the uh, government regulations or institutions, they'll usually want uh, 2.0 or 2.1. Uh, double A. Imagining we'll see that start to change in the next little while to 2.2. Uh, triple A is definitely the highest. Uh, it's oftentimes, and actually the W3C doesn't recommend it that you would try to achieve that 100% because it's really not going to be achievable and actually could hinder in some cases if you try to get 100%. Um, so that one has specific cases that are on a case by case basis usually. There are a lot of different accessibility laws and legislations around the world. Of course, we're uh, thinking a lot about the North American market being here in the United States and then our agency being in Canada. Uh, so we're always worried about the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, Section 508, uh, the Accessible Canada Act, which is specifically relevant to you know, federal institutions in Canada, and a few other local or provincial legislations within uh, the larger provinces of, of Canada. They have their own specifications. Uh, of course, the ADA and Section 508 are particularly relevant uh, to all of you folks. So how do we know if our site is actually accessible? Well, we have to do some testing. Uh, and there's a few different kinds of, of, of tests that we can do. There is a manual test, uh, or manual testing, uh, and automated testing. Um, it's important, I think, to talk about manual testing first before getting into automated, which is what we'll spend most of the time talking about. Um, and I hate to say it, but if anybody was really thinking I had a silver bullet as for how you can just do everything automated, um, I won't be disappointing you. There is no silver bullet. There probably never will be. It is a very, it's, it's a complicated subject. There's a lot to, to worry about. So automated accessibility testing, when we talk about that, we're only talking about maybe it's 40%, maybe it's 50%. Uh, it's, it's a fairly low percentage of what we can actually achieve through, through testing. So I do want to sort of at the very least quickly address that. Um, Manual testing is usually we focus on sort of things that are operable with, with other, other technologies like a keyboard. Uh, it might be things that are understandable with a screen reader so that the content flows in the right way and it's actually, you know, you can listen to it and, and, it, and it works well. Uh, also content that is perceivable. So as I was kind of saying earlier, you know, are there things that, um, ways that we can make something that's perceivable in, in different ways through closed captioning or, or alternative texts. So you can imagine, if we're having to go through all this kind of thing, how difficult that might be, how long that might take uh, to do that with a website, with a whole website that might be, you know, some of our institutions are 3,000 pages or more. Um, that's going to take a long time to go through a whole site like that. So um, 
it, it, it's, it's a complex process, uh, and unfortunately, manual testing is always going to be a part of that. That said, we, we can automate parts of it, um, and there's a bunch of different tools that can help with that. Um, some of these tools are the sort of like page level tools, so we have Axe and Wave, or two common ones. There's, there's a whole bunch more. Some of the uh, more site level tools, uh, Dubbot, surprising, I know. Um, site Improve, Sort Site, they're all kind of you know going through the same kind of idea, scanning websites. Um, in terms of those sort of page level tools, this is what we often see. This is the Axe Dev Tools. And, um, it's built into, well, it's a browser extension. Um, you can open it up and install it and use it on your browser. But it's looking at the page. Uh, it's not looking at the site. So it's giving you whatever's on that page that may need to be addressed, but there's still, you know, 3,000, 8,000, however many thousand more pages to worry about. So that's going to take a long time. So that's when we start looking at now uh, um, using a automated tool to help us scan a whole site, provide some reports, Give us some good uh, content to actually work from here, and not have to go page by page by page um, with this sort of uh, automated testing. So, a little more about Dubbot. Uh, it is a it, it extends beyond just accessibility, but it does provide a good level of, of accessibility testing. Uh, it gives us a full site crawler, so it will go through your whole site. I'll show you how to set that up in a moment. Uh, it gives us the so currently WCAG 2.1 uh, A through AA and AAA uh, uh, tests. Um, in addition to all that, it also gives us some other tools like broken link checker, uh, spelling and readability checks. So readability checks is interesting. I'm going to touch on that one shortly as well. Uh, some other tools like SEO and, and, and a couple of other things as well. But we're just focused on the accessibility here. <coughs> so. Why do we use Dubbot? We actually use it on a bunch of our websites. Uh, I would say most of our websites, not all of them at this point, are in Dubbot. Uh, so we have a pretty big list here. I think this goes about four or five pages long of, of different websites that we have right in, in, in Dubbot. And so as an agency, it's easy for us to manage everything in one spot, uh, not have, you know, to, to have a complicated setup for each one of our clients where we have to have different logins. And it's got a really nice sort of dashboard to have everything all in there, all in one place. It's also pretty easy to add our team members. We can just add anybody we need to at any point in time. It's pretty self-service. Uh, we typically give our devs especially access to it because they're the ones that need to go in and figure everything out. Um, and it's just nice to be able to have everything all, all in one spot. It's also being a, being a cloud-based website. It means that A, it doesn't need any sort of scripts on, the, on our client websites. And B, everybody can access it from anywhere, uh, any computer. It's, uh, it's just a you know, web app. So that makes it really, really easy to, to manage that. But there's a bunch of other features that now we'll sort of start to get into. Um, I wanted to talk through how we've actually used this on a, a client site. I think that's a way to sort of you know relate to to uh, to how it, how it's used in practice. Uh, so this is uh, a website that we have been working on. It's the Gordy Howe International Bridge, which is actually uh, um, managed by the Windsor Detroit Bridge Authority. Uh, so if you can. Probably figure that out. It's a bridge between Windsor and Detroit, um, so it's being rebuilt. Uh, their website needed some some updates, so we have uh, we we've, we've taken it on to to do some various work, like some migrations, um, uh, supporting the English and French interface coming from uh, a French speaking part of Canada. Uh, we have that that ability, um, and we did a bit of a design refresh. Uh, but more, more, most importantly, probably, is the accessibility side of it. As uh, more of a government-funded agency uh, on both sides of the border, there's, there definitely is uh, a need to comply with uh, certain uh, um, accessibility standards. So just another view of the website. We'll be seeing a few different spots here. So how do we actually now use DevBot to test this website? It's actually a, it's a pretty easy setup. Uh, it's a pretty easy process. Uh, when you first add it, you know it's going to run the initial crawl of, of the entire website, which can take various amounts of time, as you can imagine. If it's a big site, it's going to take longer. Uh, we take all that content back, review it. Um, there's an export functionality. We can prioritize our fixes that we want to prioritize. Uh, not to say that any of them are more priorities necessarily, but there's always going to be some that are really big wins, easy wins that we can fix much quicker and uh, get those improvements, make a big impact right away. 
we, we being an agency, we have, of course, issue trackers. We're managing all that through through there so we can keep track of everything, keep track of our priorities, our decisions, our discussions. Um, we have it over to the developers. They make all their remediations and fixes, uh, including potentially content changes, which might end up meaning that we have to work with the, our content team or the client's content team or, or somewhere in between there. And then we validate our results, of course, right? You know, you have to test your, 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 your work. Um, and we're also monitoring for any changes later. Uh, I'll show you how, to, how, how Dumpbot makes that a little bit easier as well. So here's a quick uh, overview of the setup. It is pretty simple. It's really just, all it really needs is just a site URL and a site name. So we can give it a, a, a name and then we can put in the, the URL for the site. That, that could be as simple as it gets. Now of course you can see there's a whole bunch of other tabs here, a whole bunch of other options. Uh, we can tell it to ignore certain paths. Maybe there's a section of the site that, that isn't public yet, but it's still, still findable. Uh, we, can, we can change the different checks that we have. Of course, again, we're focusing on accessibility, but we can disable or enable some of those other checks, uh, including some of the best practices checks that you would find in there. Uh, spell checking, which is really nice if you need custom spell check, uh, and some SEO uh, functionalities as well. Um, one of probably my favorite thing is we really lock down our sites if it's a dev site or a site not live yet, and it supports that. We can put in username and password for a, a, a basically basic off, um, just a basic authentication system. Um, so there's no need to worry about is the site going to get public? Do we have to unlock it for this tool to work? It's already in there and supported. And you can see we had a number of different versions that we were playing with and setting up here. So when you first set it up, of course, it needs some time to crawl. It's not going to give you results right away. So that's usually you get a set up and you go for a go for a coffee. Um, once it's all done, then we can actually get into what the dashboard looks like. So this is after it's crawled. We see how many issues there are. Everything's in a nice spot. We get some nice visuals to help show us where we're at in terms of the progress. Uh, a whole list of, of the, the the initial sort of quick wins that might be the most impactful to fix right away. There's also the, um, the section on reports on the side there, and that's what you can get at the reports that we'll look at later and that we actually use to, to then initiate all of our work. The issues list that you can click into from that dashboard is actually pretty comprehensive as well. It's a nice sortable table, of course. Uh, it's really the same thing as what you'll see in the reports, but the nice thing about it is, of course, it's, it's an interactive, you know, you can sort by different things, you can then click in. Um, but also, you can also filter by the different uh, um, levels of, of, of uh, accessibility of WCAG requirements. So you can filter by the different uh, you know, 2.1, uh, AA, AAA, et cetera. So it makes it easy to sort of break down uh, the, the results that you're looking at and not have to see this, this big list of everything. The page inspector, now this is probably the most powerful thing. This is what, what you'll spend most of the time in if you're trying to, to address some of these issues. Um, it's, it's actually quite powerful because it's, it's, as you can see, it's giving you the overlay of the page on top of the, uh, the, the results here. Um, and as you sort of go through it, you have different options to see the CSS selectors of the elements that are not compliant, the code itself, which is nice for a developer to be able to see that snapshot at, at that point in time. Um, there's also a direct link to the WCAG uh, success criteria and pages. So you don't need to worry about you know, searching for this now. You can click straight on it and get that opened up. Get the information that you need right there. And do this much faster when you're dealing with, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands of pages. It's much easier to see what is this exact issue and how are we going to solve it. You can ignore some rules as well if maybe there's a good reason to do that. That's uh, definitely uh, possible. There's also this ability to create tasks and assign tasks. So if you're working with a team, maybe some of these are content entry issues that need to be addressed. Uh, maybe it's that you have different developers working on this same uh, page and wanting to make it clear who's assigned to what. So that's really nice. We honestly don't use it because we're using our own ticketing system. But I can see how somebody using just this tool would probably get a good benefit out of that. It's really nice to have that sort of control and be able to uh, uh, you know, assign things and, and know who's working on what. The readability I mentioned earlier, this is a, there is a, a double, a tri like triple A level uh, uh, success criterion for uh, read reading levels. And so 
Um, uh, Dumbbot does, as it's going through its scans, it'll give you these different ratings of, of reading levels. And so you can use these to really determine if that's something that your content has to comply with, uh, does it comply? It doesn't get flagged as an actual accessibility issue uh, because it's not, oftentimes not something that uh, is um, you know, something that, that you have to comply with. But if that is a requirement for your audience and, and is necessary, uh, we have an option in here as well to, to drill down into that, see what the reading score is, and, and get some more detail about, uh, about that. Some other helpful tools that, that we often use is, of course, being able to see a snapshot of your source code. Because oftentimes, if we're all making changes, a few of the devs are working on something, somebody will change one thing, and then we don't realize that maybe that's already fixed our, our issue. So we can see that snapshot at the point in time and be able to say, okay, well, this is why it's actually already been fixed. Um, we also have the ability to disable CSS, which is really nice. It's, it's pretty simple to do that for a developer, but it's nice to have this all in this one wrapped up space uh, because it helps us to verify the, the flow of the document. Is the heading level correct? Um, so disabling the CSS, we see the true heading levels of everything. We can reanalyze or, or refresh the content. So when we've made some changes, we can validate it really quickly right in here, make sure that we've actually fixed that issue and uh, be ready to go on to the next step. Oops. A few other ones is the, the color picker. Uh, if, you have a, a, if you have a failure on color contrast, this will actually let you just tweak those foreground and background colors a little bit to find the right combination to meet the success criterion for the, for the contrast for your level of, of accessibility. Uh, and it's nice to have it again all in one spot. I have to then switch to another tool as you're trying to maybe quickly work your way through what could be hundreds of issues across hundreds of pages. Having it all in one spot really helps to speed that all up. And again, you can imagine an agency going through a lot of this. We're trying to do it as quickly as we can, make sure that being addressed correctly, and make sure that uh, we're going to end up with the right result. Now, of course, tweaking colors, if there's any designers in the room, you're probably screaming internally because we want to make sure that we're validating and working with uh, the right uh, color uh, uh, design uh, uh, specs. So uh, that might not be relevant for everybody, but it's still nice to be able to tweak it. And then you, then you can go back to your, develop, your, your designers and say, hey, this isn't matching. We know that this color would, how can we work together on that? Dubbot also has a Drupal module. Uh, it's actually still fairly new. But what it does is it, it exposes a lot of the issues, uh, the issue states into Drupal. So you can now see everything all, all in one spot for your content editors. Um, so you can see here, it's basically giving us the, what is basically the sidebar of a, uh, Dubbot report right in Drupal. This just kind of overlays on top of the content. When you're in viewing a page and logging as administrator, you can see all of your issues and uh, get a good overview that way. As you're browsing around, you'll see that in the, uh, the top of the screen there, you'll see that um, the admin toolbar sort of pop up and show you how many issues are on this specific page. And then when you click on that, that's when you now get the sidebar pop out on top of the content. And right in there, there's the view in Dubbot. If you need more information, uh, you can go straight, straight into there. But it's just nice to have that in there. Your content team can be going about their work and see, oh, we have a, a, an issue on, on this page. Maybe it's something they can fix right then and there if it's uh, something that's, that's easy enough. There's also a page uh, that gives you the listing of all of the issues on the site, uh, right in Drupal. Uh, there's a specific path to, to go to. It's in the, the help documentation. But it's just nice to have it all in one spot. You can, again, go right to the page, go right to the, the report on Dubbot, and really see what, uh, what your next steps might be for those issues. This is the report now. Uh, it's a, you know, it's just a CSV, which is actually really nice. Again, developer, um, it's nice to be able to get that out and be able to then start to bring it to other places. Maybe we want to put it into Google Sheets and do some pivot tables, all that kind of stuff. Um, but uh, more importantly, it also then creates or contains the actual content again, the actual HTML that is offending in this case, which is really great because then when you are when you export this content, um, say it's your project manager or somebody doing this, uh, they can paste it right to you, and you can then get to get to the issue. Or if you're that that person that's looking at the reports, 
It's nice to have everything all in one spot. And again, having that snapshot of that point in time, it's incredibly helpful to be able to see what it was that happened at that time in case that's changed. Being a cloud-based service, of course, is going to have some type of emails. So we can get uh, up-to-date emails on how the content is going, what's, um, you know, if there's anything new that's been introduced as maybe content is changing, as code is changing. Uh, so it's nice to be able to get this. Uh, our dev team is watching for these kinds of things. We'll see these reports and, and notice if maybe uh, we introduce a regression in the latest uh, code change, or, or maybe there was some, some content issues that came up in something that, that was recently changed. So uh, having that alerting sort of uh, is uh, you know, it's a good way to, to keep on top of everything. So just want to quickly sort of uh, summarize all of that. Um, why do we use Dubbot? It's mostly because it gives us the features that we find that we need. Uh, it's the full site crawl, so we can really get a good overview of the entire site and know what's going to, our next step's going to be. Uh, it's easy for us to manage it for all of our clients and not have to worry about you know, them having to get involved in anything. We can take that on and worry about everything on our own. The, the uh, debugging tools, that ability to have the, the, the sidebar highlighting exactly the element on the page, um, getting that snapshot of the code base, it's really nice. The developers really like to, to use that. They all have access to the uh, demo portal itself so that you know, they don't have to just rely on that content from that report. They can go right in, inspect everything, figure out the, the right areas. And it's that continuous monitoring. We can always get a new uh, uh, CSV report, bring it in somewhere and see what's changing. Uh, we always get those emails and be able to sort of react when something, uh, maybe something new has been introduced in there. So it's really nice to have all that, that capability. So that's what I have for you today. Uh, definitely open to any questions on, on any of that. Um, yeah, is there any questions? Yes, you can go ahead. Do you know if there's any integration into other like ticketing systems like Jira or stuff like that where you could use Dubbot in and kind of create that task there, but it gets imported into like the system we're using? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, as far as I know, it does not. Yeah. Um, there might be a way to automate just the exporting of the CSVs. Um, I don't, I don't know for certain that it has that, but I would imagine that's something that could be uh, a good opportunity there. Um, then you can use that to generate that. But there's no, as far as I know, there's no direct integration with any other ticketing systems. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, I think you were the first one afterwards. Uh, couple, couple questions actually. Uh, first, um, do you have any experience with site improvement, and if so, do you, can you kind of? Uh, Give a, uh, a comparison. Um, I have some more specific questions about it too. With your site group, but I'm just kind of wanting to get your take. I guess the one specific question I have is how how often does it crawl? Like the frequency like, can you get? I know some people get some experience with site group. It can be like weeks before it around. Ah, uh, yes. Full uh, site report. I'm just curious about the frequency most. Yeah. So uh, it will crawl weekly. Um, I don't recall if there was an option to configure that interval. But there is in Dubbot, in, in yeah, perfect. Uh, but you can also always go and hit recrawl whenever you want, uh, both on the page and on the whole site. Um, so that's another feature that we use all the time because we'll make a big sweeping change, say, uh, in the template, and we want to see if that actually then. So we can just go and hit recrawl. It's going to take another you know hour maybe to give us the full result back, but then we can come back after that and, and see that our change was effective. Um, so. Yeah, in terms of like how it compares in general, um, it is, I would say, one of the, the, the newer uh, products on the market. There might be some features that Dubbot doesn't have that Site Improve does have. Um, one of the reasons that you know, we, we, we have used uh, Site Improve, myself not as deeply, but I definitely used it for uh, reviewing an audit report. Um, and it has a, lo a, a lot of uh, similar features, but um, honestly, part of it comes down to it's, uh, it's a bit of a pricey uh, solution. Um, so we found that Dubbot is a really good alternative, uh, and uh, the fact that we can manage it all ourselves uh, is really been really nice for us. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, where do you integrate this into your uh, project workflow? Like, uh, like, what at what point do you kind of 
point it at a site and say, okay, where are we at? It would usually to to actually take on like a full sort of audit of a of a site that's say in progress. A little bit later on in the in the build, because usually earlier on, the, the signal to noise would just be probably way too high. Uh, we're you know focusing on, on everything else. Uh, we do also use a lot of the sort of single page tools like Axe Dev Tool, for example, uh, and that'll help us as we're doing our actual development to sort of check our work. Um, so at that point, you know, when we've got something a new sort of template or a new feature developed, we'll go in and actually use Dev Tools because that's more a little bit more uh, tailored to that one template uh, uh, workflow that we're working on at that point or a new component. So we would probably rely a little more on those tools earlier on in the project. Then later on, when we're getting closer to that like full UAT, of course, we really need content to get really good results. Um, running it against a, a site with no content is going to give us like you know navigation is missing something or or a footer, um, you know, footer or something like that, templates. But once the content starts to get entered in. I think that's when we really start to think about turning it on and, and actually paying a closer attention to, to what that's getting us. Yes? I kind of have multiple questions, but um, with the, the logging in, uh, does that mean it'll scan Drupal from like a, as an administrator? Like it'll, it'll like scan your admin thing as well? Or? No, good question. No, so it's it's um it's not. It's more like a, there's the you know there's, there's the Drupal Shield module that basically just puts when you go to the site it puts that that like typical like OS level um, authentication um, prompt in front of you, uh, and that's usually like not a per person account. That's just a global account. Gotcha. Um, so usually it will be like you know. Uh, uh, Dev Dev or something might, might be your username and password because it's really just about like, protecting crawlers from finding the site at that point or, or something along those lines. Um, so it's not going to get into administrative stuff. It's not going to get into looking at the admin theme or anything. It is just on the the front end for authenticating to be able to see the front end if you've locked that down. Okay. Uh, two other questions. Uh, can you control which uh, like web crawler it uses or like the the crawler settings? Um, there is uh, some of those settings um, that you know, kind of bounce over some of them, but you can control like maybe where it's going. Uh, there's some rules that you can enable or disable. Like what would show up on your, your logging and that kind of stuff? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. Oh, well, there you go. That's actually, I didn't know that. That would be really helpful. And uh, pricing? Is there like notice? That's a good question. Uh, I don't know the pricing, um, but we have a pretty good contact over at Dubbot that we work with on a lot of things. Um, I'd be happy to get you uh, in touch with, with him if uh, you're looking for that. Sweet. Um, yeah. Yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely come back afterwards. Um, is there a limit to how many uh, pages it will crawl and how many users you're allowed to have it? If there is, we haven't found it yet. Uh, we have a site that has at least 8,000 pages. Um, <coughs> and that's probably on the lower side for some sites. So um, we haven't hit that limit yet. Uh, and I. There might be, I don't know, a documented limit. There might be an undocumented limit, but yeah. Um, in terms of users, I think we're at like the 40 or 50 users and we haven't run into anything. Now, we have you know, sort of more of a uh, partnership with them, and, and so we may have some um, less restrictions in place. Uh, there might be some that are tied to different uh, packages and everything for, for pricing purposes, but uh, in terms of the actual uh, you know, technology, uh, I haven't run into any, any limits just yet. Oh, and another question: um, Can you do? Uh, can you create cross-site reports? Uh, you know, a report that will crawl um, all the sites at once, or do you have to do like on each site individually? Um, that's a good question. I'm actually not sure. I think we we have someone saying. Well, actually, yeah, they do. They can do page sets and attribute. Yeah. So you, can, you can turn on a CSV that has everything that has just crawl everything. Yeah. You can create an arbitrary set, like supersets, where I would like use five sites in this group, and then from that group, dashboards and aggregated reports. So we haven't uh, we haven't run into a, a need to, to do that just yet, but I can see where like, it might be helpful to have that brought to different sites, um, maybe like on a multi-site instance, for example, and really be able to have uh, those mm -hmm. broken down to, to see the on their own, but then also get a list of reports, so that's really nice to know. 
That's another yeah. yes in the comments. So, so if the crawling can bind broken links, do you know if it is also able to, and I'm assuming it can't, but it'd be great if it could. Can it find broken links in PDFs that are posted on your site? Yeah, I do believe it can. It does do PDF analysis. It's one of the other features that it does. Okay. Um, so I, I, I'm not confident, but I would be surprised if it didn't. And, I, and if it doesn't, I would be surprised if it wasn't on the roadmap. Because uh, it, does, it does do some analysis on, on PDFs and find them. And that's a pretty common uh, use case. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Does like, uh, access, like accessibility for PDFs as well? Not the accessibility side. Accessibility for PDFs is, is, a, is a question mark on, on its own. Uh, <laughs> Avoiding them is the best case scenario. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, there are cases where you need a form or something, and maybe it needs to be a printable one. So maybe there's, there's some uh, use cases, but yeah, I think just uh, avoiding them is probably the best case. That said, we certainly have you know, our fair share of, of, of clients that utilize PDFs uh, for a lot of different uh, places. So um, uh, I, I would be surprised if it did the full accessibility audit on a PDF. I think that's probably something that's left to uh, a separate sort of tool set that would be able to do that. But it would be nice to have that integrated in, in all in one spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes? You mentioned it shows how different colors will affect accessibility. What about fonts and sizes? Yeah, it will take into account as well the, the font sizes mm -hmm. as well for the, for the, for the colors. Fonts too? Or not as much? You know, if you have different stylistic for whatever purposes. Mm, I wouldn't think that it would. I don't know if that's directly connected back to a success criteria, but that's definitely something to be considering as you're looking through it. Like if a, you know, if you're using a very decorative font that might be very difficult for some people with certain uh, visual disabilities to understand, that's uh, probably more left to the manual testing of, of the whole suite of, of testing that would need to happen. Yeah. Great. Any other questions then? If not, I'll just uh, uh, mention a couple of things. Um, we do have a booth over, so if you had any questions pop up uh, in the next few hours or tomorrow, feel free to stop by our booth. We have a few people around uh, that are accessibility uh, aware and probably have some answers for you. Uh, we also have a, a Evolve UX uh, design feedback going on upstairs. Uh, next one is at three o'clock. Uh, it's not three o'clock. I should have known that. Um, uh, and uh, Suzanne Dugacheva, one of our founders, is also doing a access creating accessible content in Drupal 10 session later today at 4:15 in the uh, Cherry Chase room. Uh, and we have a couple of other events coming up. If anybody's in the Ottawa or Canada area, uh, we have an event coming up on November 28th, um, similar to this one day. A bunch of different sessions going on, uh, including some design feedback sessions as well. Uh, so really, being in Ottawa, focus a lot on federal governments and, and institutions like that. So probably pretty relevant for the audience. And we're looking to do something in March, April in Atlanta as well. So watch out for that. Uh, our websites uh, will be the best place to, to to keep up with that. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Thanks for for coming and. Uh,